Hello everybody and welcome to this very special series where we're looking at Pluto and his transit through each of the whole sign houses. I'm so excited to be sharing this series with you. If you like this video then please like, share and subscribe to my channel and if you would like to study astrology further and in depth with me and even gain a certification if you desire then please consider joining my classes at the Royal Stars Academy. The link is in the description below. Now on the 23rd of March 2023 which is ahead in time at the moment that I am recording this but maybe you're watching this after that has occurred Pluto will make his first foray into the sign of Aquarius since he was last there in 1781. Now it's been a long time between Aquarian transits for the little planet Pluto. As such I thought it would be a good time to talk about Pluto changing signs and what it will mean for everyone depending on your rising sign in whole sign astrology. So this, this video series uh, will be applicable whenever Pluto changes signs in the future. But as I'm recording this in the run up to Pluto and Aquarius in 2023 it's very pertinent to us now and will be pertinent to us for almost 20 years as Pluto moves through this sign, the sign of Aquarius. Now Pluto is an unusual planet in astrology and also in astronomy. So for a start he has an elliptical orbit which means that he spends different lengths of time in each zodiac sign. I'm going to talk about the lengths of time a little later in this introduction. But check out this diagram of Pluto's orbit and you'll see how different it is to all the other planets in the solar system. So let's look a little more now at the astronomy of Pluto. So although astronomically it's classified as a dwarf planet in astrology we all know that Pluto packs a massive punch you know and but more on the astrology of Pluto a little bit later. However just because an object is small and because an object is far away doesn't mean that it's not powerful. Pluto is atomically powerful and anyone who's familiar with astrology will know that he is really punchy. So our moon Luna is actually it weighs six times as much as Pluto does. It's more hefty in that sense. First little tidbit of information astronomically about Pluto. We, we realize that he is a small object at the far reaches of the solar system. It's quite amazing that we know of his existence actually especially as our, our moon um, is more weighty than he is. It takes 248 years for Pluto to do a complete cycle around the sun and Pluto's average surface temperature is a very chilly minus 230 degrees Celsius. It actually feels like that today where I am <laughs> as I'm recording this in the middle of winter. 200, minus 280 degrees Celsius is actually minus 382 degrees Fahrenheit. So you can imagine wherever you are in the world how cold that actually is. Not surprising consider, considering Pluto is at the far reaches of the solar system a long way from the sun. Now Pluto has five known moons and is classified as I said as one of the dwarf planets along with Eris who is the largest of the dwarf planets but also Haumea, Makemake and Ceres. They're the other dwarf planets that we know of. Now Pluto was discovered in 1930 by the American astronomer Clyde Tombaugh and in fact there's a, a uh, we'll talk about this in a minute but there is a, um, a, a glacier on Pluto that they've named after the man who discovered Pluto and Pluto resides in the Kuiper belt at the very edge of the solar system beyond Neptune and the name Pluto was actually suggested by a young 11 year old child named v um, Venetia Burnley, Burney, sorry, um, and she was a mythology lover so contrary to popular opinion she didn't name Pluto after the Disney dog. In fact the naming of the Disney dog, dog came not long after the naming of the tiny planet who was named after Pluto in ancient mythology and we're going to talk about that very soon. 
One thing that fascinates me about Pluto is that when the shuttle, the New Horizons shuttle, um, t went past Pluto in 2015, it took some photos as it passed by this tiny planet. Once again, check out these photos. Now you'll notice this heart-shaped colouring on the side of Pluto. I find this fascinating. Well, this is a glacier named after the discoverer of Pluto, and it's a glacier of frozen nitrogen. Now, due to the, the heat or the temperature below the surface of this glacier, this heart shape slowly churns over the course of millennia. So it changes over the course of millennia. And scientists believe that the glacial churning is ice continually refreshing itself, which is why the glacier actually shows no signs of cratorial impact you know like there's moons uh, uh, Pluto has five moons and they all show evidence of having been hit by um, having craters because they've been hit by asteroids and things like that this glacier has no evidence of that because of this churning that refreshes it keep that in mind keep the word refreshing in mind because it correlates as above so below to how we understand Pluto in astrology and keep in mind the significance of our first human beholding of Pluto which revealed this beating heart it refreshes and you know it, it expands and contracts and expands and contracts as part of its refreshing process it ebbs and flows with the cycles of the warming and cooling that Pluto experiences as it travels around the Sun because sometimes Pluto is closer to the Sun than at other times and that affects its speed as it travels through the zodiac signs so in essence Pluto's temperature ebbs and flows which causes this heart to ebb and flow as it refreshes its cycle it's the beating heart of Pluto this is very important to remember when we, when we come to talk about the astrology shortly now scientists also believe that when Pluto was a very young planet it probably contained a H2O ocean a water ocean in fact it's also likely to have some sort of water um, in an oceanic form still in existence underneath its icy crust but of course we haven't landed on Pluto to determine that we're only surmising so it's a planet of mysteries astronomically that are slowly but surely being revealed to all of humanity and I find all these discoveries to be very exciting especially when we see the world through the lens of the as above so below hermetic principle what about the mythology of Pluto well Pluto was in mythology the son of the Titan God Saturn and he was one of uh, three brothers uh, and three sisters and two of the brothers and three the three sisters were eaten by Saturn or Kronos um, and these these gods that were eaten these brothers and sisters that were eaten were known collectively as the Olympians and they were vomited up when they were rescued by their heroic brother and king of the gods Jupiter and I talked about the mythology of Jupiter in my series on Jupiter transiting through all the houses if you want to check that out but Pluto is one of these three supreme male deities of the ancient Olympian Parthenon along with his siblings Jupiter, Neptune, Pluto, they were the masculine ones, and his sisters, Juno, Vesta, and Ceres, the six of them. So Pluto was the mysterious Roman god of the dead and the lord of the underworld. And this is why I've got this little display happening here. We've got a, um, a face mask from the Day of the Dead uh, here, some dead dried flowers. These are things that Pluto correlates to. We also have a succulent. Pluto rules succulents and cactuses. We're going to talk more about what Pluto rules shortly, but I just thought I'd explain why I've got that little display beside me to symbolize Pluto. He was the Lord of the Dead, the Lord of the Underworld. He was also known as the bringer of wealth or the God of great wealth. So the name Pluto means the unseen one, and this is why it, Pluto was given this name because he had been unseen and now was seen so very pertinent to the um, astronomical naming of Pluto which I've just described 
Pluto lived in underground, gloomy places, and he seemed to, as a god, have very little interest in the world of men. But similarly, he also had um, very little interest in the affairs of the gods as well, and he tended to avoid associating with men and gods. He was very much the loner god. He was a figure in ancient mythology of enormous dread, terrible might, like very powerful God, very powerful God. And he was a God who dispensed luck and controlled the fates of mortals. Pretty full on, hey? He ruled the regions within the earth and everything that came out of inner earth, so to speak, the minerals, the precious stones. And this is part of the reason he was known as the God of great wealth. Pluto was the Roman counterpart to the Greek god Hades and um, Hades ruled was the, the Greek god who ruled the underworld in Greek mythology. Pluto rode a chariot and he carried a staff in his hand and he was often accompanied by Cerebrus, a three-headed dog that served as both his pet and a guardian of the underworld. And if you've watched movies and so forth about mythology, you probably will have seen that three-headed dog represented. I think it's in the film Clash of the Titans, if I'm not mistaken, old film from the, the 60s or 70s. But one of Pluto's most famous myths centered around his abduction of the young woman Poseidon of, um, Persephone and the grief of her mother, the goddess Ceres. So Pluto, this loner god living in the gloomy underworld, rarely interacting with gods or mankind, um, was pitied by the goddess Venus. So she told her son Cupid to fire one of his love arrows at Pluto so that he would fall in love with the next woman that he saw. And that woman was Persephone. She was playing in the fields at Nyssa. So his passion and his desire was uncontrollable because of this arrow that had been fired at him by Cupid. Keep that passion and desire element in mind. It's very pertinent to the, mytho to the astrology of Pluto, actually. So in his passion, in his desire, he abducted Persephone in his chariot. And following her abduction, her mother, Sarah, searched high and low for her missing daughter in a panic and, and grief. And her search was fruitless because nobody knew where she'd gone. Persephone was in the underworld and she became there the unwilling bride of Pluto. People sometimes, in some mythologies refer to it as the rape of Persephone. But in, in essence, she became the queen of the underworld. Pluto, on the other hand, he refused to acknowledge that he had kidnapped her. Uh, he refused to even let, let it be known where she was. So she was being held in secret. I mean, one of these horrible experiences. And it brings to mind all these, these dreadful experiences that we sometimes hear in the news about abductions and kidnapping and people have been held prisoner for years and so on. And what grief that must cause the parents and, and family involved. Sarah's similarly grew very thin, she grew pale and emancipated due to her, um, her great grief, her sorrow and her constant searching for her daughter. Now Sarah's was the goddess of agriculture and fertility and because of her sorrow and her emancipated appearance it correlated to what was happening on the earth and the earth suffered. The land and the animals became barren and infertile. Um, agriculture suffered because the goddess governing those things was not in her power. She was grieving. Now, Mercury, the god of the messenger god, uh, informed Jupiter of Persephone's whereabouts. He happened to know, he happened to have heard on the grapevine where she was, and he let Jupiter know where she was. And Jupiter ordered his brother Pluto, because Jupiter was the king of the gods and everybody sort of bowed down to Jupiter. He was the rescuer, the hero who um, saved them from their father. So Jupiter ordered that Pluto release Persephone at once. And he wanted, he did that because he wanted to restore the fertility to the earth. And of course, Pluto had to comply um, to avoid the wrath of his brother, uh, the king of the gods, Jupiter. So having no choice, Pluto returned Persephone. But on the proviso, that she had not eaten anything while she was in the underworld because if she had she would therefore belong to the underworld if she'd ingested anything that that came from the underworld and it was discovered that persephone had consumed a few pomegranate seeds while she was in the underworld and so pluto demanded that 
Persephone should remain with him for a portion of each year. Jupiter agreed to this demand because she had consumed fruit from the underworld, um, pomegranate seeds. And so he ordered that Persephone would spend half her time with Ceres on the earth and half her time with Pluto in the underworld. And now we see this represented in the seasons. You know, Persephone leaves the earth in early autumn and we start to, you know, things die down, things get cold and wintry, the earth is infertile and frozen and barren. And she returns back to Ceres, Persephone comes back to her mother in early spring. And this is obviously when things begin to bloom, the days get warmer, um, and we find that things start to fruit and flourish again. So during her absence, Ceres is grieving and the world grows barren. And when she returns, the world flourishes back to life. And you notice the symbology here, death and rebirth, very much associated with the essence of Pluto, that he rules death, but he is also associated with the rebirthing phase due to this mythology. So due to Pluto's mysterious nature and his association with death, he was not a central figure in the worship of um, Roman state religion. So there were no state festivals, no temples, no dedications in his honor. Um, he had little to do with the, the world of men and men tended, you know, the world of mankind tended to avoid him as well. Um, so let's talk about Pluto in astrology. This gets really interesting and exciting. Pluto is the modern ruler of the sign of Scorpio. And like the mysterious water sign, they do share many similarities in the things that they govern. Now, Pluto is really the planet that defines the 20th century, the century that's just been. Um, because he entered our collective consciousness... In, in other words, he was discovered and we became aware of him in 1930. Now, obviously, he had existed for millennia before that. But we only found out about Pluto as human beings on the Earth in 1930. And so Pluto has connections to everything that manifested around that time, sort of within 20 years either side of 1930. Now this includes atomic energy, nuclear power, plutonium, weapons of mass destruction. Those heavy duty things that I've just mentioned, I mean imagine the permanent winter that would be visited upon the earth in the event of a nuclear holocaust. Persephone might never return if those things were unleashed on the earth. Pluto has governance of those things. Let, let's hope they're never unleashed because we rather enjoy having Persephone return in the springtime. So the Pluto in Leo generation, I'll talk about the generations of Pluto in just a second. The Pluto in Leo generation were the first full generation born into the conscious awareness of Pluto. So Pluto was halfway through the sign of Cancer when he was discovered um, and, and so by the time the Pluto and Leo generation, the baby boomers, were being born, everybody knew about Pluto. He was in full conscious awareness. So the Pluto and Leo generation, all of them, everyone born with Pluto and Leo, hold this awareness and their consciousness and their, their human state of Pluto and his amazing power, amazing and terrifying power. And it's really interesting to me to observe what's going on in the world now in 2022 as I'm recording this, that it's the Pluto and Leo generation that are holding the power of Pluto in their hands. And the eventuality of whether we go into a nuclear winter or not is in the hands of the leaders of our day and age, which for better or worse are Pluto, the Pluto and Leo generation. So Pluto is the planet that defines the generations. Let me go through the examples. And as I do this, you'll see how Pluto spends different lengths of time in different signs because he has this very strange orbit. So Pluto was in Leo from 1937 to 1956. He was 19 years in the sign of Leo. This is the baby boomer generation. Pluto was in Virgo from 1956 to 1971, 15 years. You can see it's getting less, 15 years in the sign of Virgo. This is the Generation X 
or the, the group one, if you like, of Generation X. And then Pluto was in Libra from 1971 to 1983, 13 years in this sign, it's getting less again. This was group two of Generation X because some people in this generation classify themselves as Generation X. But I have read that um, this generation is also known as the Xennials, X E W N I A L S, the Xennials. Um, then Pluto was in Scorpio from 1983 to 1985 only 12 years in the sign of Scorpio. This is where Pluto spends his shortest length of time in the sign of Scorpio. And this is Gen Y, the millennials, uh, Pluto and Scorpio generation. I'm excited by this generation because it's, it's this generation, Gen Y, the millennials, and because they are born with Pluto in Scorpio, the sign that Pluto rules, they are waking the world up to the power of astrology and the occult again. And they're very intense, they're, very, they're a very intense generation. We'll find out why because as we go along here because Pluto is a very intense planet, powerful people, powerful generation, powerful planet in a very powerful position. So this generation are going to be the movers and shakers. They're going to be the ones who change the world and hopefully regenerate the world and bring the springtime back to the world from what has been stolen which i believe has been stolen over the last uh 80 years or so um and we're getting up to sort of 90 to 100 years since pluto has been discovered so um very interesting generation to keep an eye on the pluto in sagittarius generation uh goes from 1995 to 2008 pluto was 13 years in this sign this is generation z Pluto in Capricorn, um, Pluto spent 15 years in the sign of Capricorn from 2008 to 2023. Now we're coming to the conclusion of the Pluto in Capricorn years and it has been said that this is known as Generation Alpha, these, uh, this particular generation. Then from 2023 to 2040, um, yeah, 2043, Pluto is going to be in Aquarius. And this is going to be 20 years in this sign. A new generation will begin in 2023. Pluto will then be in Pisces from 2043 to 2068. 25 years in the sign of Pisces. He's going to be 29 years in the sign of Aries, which is going to last from 2068 to 2097. Then he's going to move into Taurus for 33 years. And you know Taurus sits opposite uh, Scorpio. This is where Pluto spends the longest duration, 33 years in the sign of Taurus from 2097 to um, 2130. 2130 is, um, is when that period, that generation is going to end. And then we will have Pluto in Gemini. That's going to be for 30 years. Now the length of time in a sign starts to decrease. This is going to last from 2030, sorry, 2130 to 2160, 30 years in the sign of Gemini. And then Pluto in Cancer for, from 2160 to 2186, 26 years in the sign of Cancer. And then we're back to Pluto in Leo all over again. So that's how Pluto governs the generations is a very generational planet and we define our generational influences by the length of time Pluto spends in each sign. So in any singular lifetime Pluto is only ever going to transit three to at most six houses because he just takes that long to move through a sign. So therefore, the transits of Pluto that you will have in your lifetime are extremely important to your life. You incarnated to experience those particular transits for the growth of your soul, for better or worse. Now, not everyone's going to experience a transit of Pluto to the powerful first house, but those that do will experience life-changing results. Not everyone's going to experience a transit of Pluto to the 10th house, but those that do are likely to go through a powerful change in how they are perceived by the world at large. Not everyone's going to go through a, a Pluto transit to the 3rd house, but those that do will experience extraordinary up-leveling of intuition and communicative skills. So wherever Pluto is making his transits over the course of your lifetime, 
is just what your soul needs for your growth. So Pluto is the expression, this is what Pluto rules in astrology, what he's all about in astrology, he is power and powerful people, control, hidden realms, anything that's taboo, anything that brings a crisis into our life, nuclear holocaust, big time crisis, that's Pluto, you know, any, any type of crisis is a Pluto event. Um, Pluto also has to do with purging in our life, releasing, letting go of, excreting and getting rid of things. That's Pluto. Pluto also rules renewal. Hence, we have that mythology of the renewal of the springtime after the winter. Death and rebirth, renewal, transformation. Big mythology of change, you know, winter to spring. That transform transformation from cold to warmth, um, from death to to life. Pluto rules those things. Anything in life that brings a transformation is from Pluto. It'll consider a Plutonian experience. Pluto rules rebirthing, um, regeneration, renovation. He, he brings hidden things, things that are secret, out into the light. Remember his name and the meaning of his name, that which is hidden. And then he's been discovered in our lifetime. He is We have brung the hidden things into the light. Pluto rules or has to do with inc having incredible ambition, second to none. People with Pluto strong in their chart on the ascendant or conjunct with the sun or the moon, maybe on the midheaven as well. People who have Pluto strong in their chart are the masters of ambition, the masters of hustle. They get things done. They make it happen because that's what Pluto is all about. In a sense, Pluto is a bit like Jupiter. Jupiter amplifies in astrology whatever it connects with or wherever it sits in a horoscope. Jupiter, Jupiter makes it bigger, larger, bigger than life. However, rather than amplification, Pluto, because amplification is Jupiter, Pluto tends to give tremendous power to wherever it sits in life. For example, Pluto in a conjunction with Venus gives powerful desires and powerful passions. Just like in the mythology, when Venus um, told her son to fire the arrow at Pluto, what did it give to Pluto? Powerful desire, powerful passion. Same deal in astrology. When Venus and Pluto are sitting together in the chart, powerful desire, powerful passion present in your life. When Pluto sits with the sun, you get a powerful ego, a powerful sense of identity. Wherever Pluto sits, whatever planet it sits with, whatever house it's in, it's going to empower that realm of our life. So there's tremendous intensity wherever Pluto sits in a chart. Pluto strong people can actually be very intense people because Pluto is an intense planet and they can often be very polarizing. Why is that? Well, we are at one end of the solar system, up sitting up near the sun, getting nice and warm. Where's the other end? The polaric opposite, Pluto, right out in the Kyber belt. Pluto can be polarizing. We either love Pluto people or they turn us right off and we want to have nothing to do with them. Madonna has Pluto in her first house. Those who are familiar with the singer Madonna from the 80s and early 90s. And I always found her to be one of the most polarizing celebrities. I couldn't understand why everybody liked her so much. Um, okay, her music was fine and everything, but as a person, I just found her completely off-putting. And that's my opinion, which I'm entitled to. You're entitled to yours. But she has Pluto in her first house. And people either loved her to bits or they just were like, what the? No way. So Madonna is a perfect example of how polarizing to my mind, a Plutonian type person can be. Pluto is a planet that decomposes. That's what death does. It sort of eats away at things, the maggots and the what have you, eating away at the flesh, decomposes things. Pluto also composts things. And what do we do when we compost something? We throw it on our plants, we throw it on our garden. And, and what happens then? The daffodils come up, the roses bloom brighter and stronger and with greater scent. Our decomposition, our composting of whatever's going on in our life gives a rebirth to fruiting and flourishing. That's Pluto energy. The phoenix bird is also associated with Pluto. 
What is the Phoenix Bird all about? The death, if you've watched um, Maleficent, the film Maleficent, very Plutonian uh, character, Maleficent. What happens in the sequel to Maleficent? She, not to give the plot away, but she dies and is reborn as the Phoenix Bird. So very Plutonian imagery. Again, Pluto is the ancient god of great wealth as well as the god of the underworld in mythology. So in our underworld times, when we go through the darkness, when we go through the shadow period of our life, the, the, um, the deep um, journey of the soul, uh, then we often discover the hidden reserves of personal power in those times. We discover enlightenment in that dark night of the soul. We discover the resilience within which transforms us and enables us to emerge into our power, into our springtime, out of the darkness into the springtime. So this is what true wealth is. Yes, Pluto also has connections to physical wealth, to jewels and gold and things that come from within the earth and the wealth that it generates. Definitely has connections to that. But true wealth is found when we've gone through the dark night of the soul, our underworld experiences, our inner battle psychologically and we've come out the other side we've faced death and death no longer has any fear for us because we've been into the darkness and we emerge into our power and our springtime people with pluto strong in their chart tend to to go through times like that in life that transform them and you know they might start out in life with their power taken away from them through sickness or through abuse or difficulties or whatever but when they go through the darkness and they emerge out the other side they stand in their power having overcome the sickness the abuse the um the darkness that their life has represented pluto strong people have a a difficult course to chart in life but a great personal power that that they can generate that can serve them well once they emerge into their springtime and take their power back now there is a shadow side to Pluto if you haven't already gathered <laughs> what I've talked about is perhaps the more positive sides of Pluto that we can work with and utilize personal power great wealth, um, you know, composting and rebirthing ourselves. These are actually positives that we can utilize in our life, transformation. But there is a very dark side to Pluto, naturally. Cruelty and abuse are associated with Pluto. And usually we find those exhibiting when we find Pluto in hard aspect with Mars or occasionally with Saturn as well. Um, Pluto expresses either as the giver of the abuse. So if you've got Pluto, let's say, in a conjunction with Mars, for example, it's not always going to exhibit this way, um, but this is it can uh, work out through that conjunction of Mars and, and Pluto, that we are the giver of abuse to others. We're abusive. Um, but it can also work out that people with Pluto Mars conjunction are also the recipients of the abuse in life. So if you have a Pluto Mars conjunction, you might have experienced a lot of abuse in your life. And you need to be very consciously aware of not becoming the abuser who gives it out to others because you've suffered it. So um, cruelty and abuse are the shadow side that we see with Pluto energy. Um, Pluto it also uh, is willpower. Now that can be positive if we're using our willpower to overcome our lives, our life's difficulties. But willpower that destroys things, ambition that stops at nothing, is the shadow side of Pluto energy. And many politicians and successful people have a strong Pluto in their chart because they have this ruthless ambition, this willpower that stops at nothing to dominate and control everything. That's, the shadow, that's another shadow side of Pluto and it's really um, heavy duty. Pluto strong people can be edge walkers. What do I mean by that? Well, think about it. Pluto resides on the edge of the solar system. Thus, he represents the edge of our conscious knowledge 
risk takers in in a very dark sense of the word people who who err on almost the evil side they're willing to go to the edge and associate with nasty people and make deals with the devil and those sorts of things now you can be an edge walker in positive pluto energy as well and this would look like somebody who enjoys extreme sports or someone who loves mystery and crime novels um my kids are actually very into this to be honest they they love the sort of like the horror-y kind of scary films and that sort of thing they love the the um the, the sort of dark fairy tales and, and that kind of stuff. So um, that's that's things that get your adrenaline pumping, things that get you on the edge of your seat. That's what it means to be an edge walker. And that's the positive expression. If you've got Pluto strong in your chart and you want to counteract any sort of evil inclinations, then go and read lots of crimes and thrillers and horrors, you know, get in, get into that stuff, you know, read up about serial killers and, um, you know, deep psychological understanding of the criminal mind and research those things. Because the more you get involved in the positive expression of Pluto energy, the less you're going to have a desire to go into the ruthless, evil, cruel, other shadow side that is Pluto energy. Now, I've talked a lot about the darkness of Pluto in this introduction, and I want to come back to what I talked about earlier now, which is what the New Horizons probe discovered when it flew past Pluto in 2015, and that was the heart, the beating heart on the side of Pluto. This is very much an as above, so below principle that we're seeing here. Pluto has a heart. He did have a heart in mythology. He fell passionately in love with Persephone. Okay, well, he was cruel and he, you know, abducted her and what have you. But there is a heart there that feels things, that feels things deeply. Plutonian people do feel very deeply, very intensely, very passionately. This heart on the side of Pluto should represent to us the passion that, that is available to us. We all have Pluto somewhere in the chart. We all have passions and desires in relation to something in our life. And it is okay to honor those things, heart-centered. And I want to just bring to light the awareness that often when we go through our shadow experiences, our darkness, our, you know, the 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 evil side of who we are or we're we're in a state of of melancholy and depression and and deep struggle with life we're in our underworld phase just know if you're going through that at the moment if you're experiencing fear or trauma of some sort that you have the ability within you to regenerate and rebirth and come back with a strong heart that is capable of loving again, that is capable of experiencing and feeling once more good things in the sunshine and the springtime. Pluto has a heart. There is gold in the underworld experiences that you have, and there is a renewal in the underworld experiences that you go through, and we all go through them. Um, there is also love at the core of what Pluto does in our life. Why? Because Pluto really does want to heal us because he loves us. A couple of my girlfriends and I have had many discussions, um, my astrologically minded girlfriends, have had many discussions about Pluto. A number of my highly intuitive girlfriends believe that Pluto is actually a feminine planet. Now, he was a, an ancient god uh, of masculine quality but there is also something deeply um, passionately feminine and Pluto rules a feminine sign Scorpio I'm not here to get into a debate about whether or not Pluto is a masculine or feminine planet or energy that's something that you're welcome to do in the discussion comments section but keep in I do want people to keep in mind that Pluto has a heart that there is a purpose to your underworld experiences. And if you see your difficult experiences in life as a chance to renew yourself and discover the gold and the strength within you, the power that is within you, then you will come out victorious. 
there is purpose to Pluto difficulties. That said, Pluto in karmic astrology is one of the most powerful planets. He is the planet of trauma and the trauma of our past lives. He represents that in the chart where our traumas in past lives have come from. Plus, he also represents the antidote to our trauma, the healing of our trauma, the renewal of ourselves after our karmic darkness. So if you're interested in karmic astrology, then do come study with me at the Royal Stars Academy. We will be exploring Pluto karma in greater depth in the courses that I offer there. So just to briefly sum up with a few things that Pluto rules, like I said, succulents and cactus, dead things, festivals that have to do with death and rebirth. Pluto, Pluto rules blowflies. Pluto rules toilets and plumbing. Pluto rules poisons, poisonous animals, abduction, obviously. Pluto rules cesspools. Pluto rules sex organs. Pluto rules the subconscious workings of the mind and the body. Pluto rules bombs. Pluto rules godivas, catacombs, cemeteries. Pluto rules pests and pest control control, plutonium, murder, monsters, Pluto rules psychology, Pluto rules sex, snakes, sorcerers, Pluto rules the subterranean realms of the earth, he rules taxation, terrorism, toilets, tombs, Pluto rules laser beams, kidnapping, marshes, massacres, Pluto rules um, masochism. Now I need to just quantify that one or clarify that one. Uh, Pluto rules masochism in the sense of cruelty to others, that's the Pluto side of masochism. Neptune also has associations with masochism um, in the sense that Neptune rules the de self-debasement aspect of masochism. Okay, just to make clear that one. Anything morbid is ruled by Pluto. Anything black, which is why I'm wearing black for this series, um, is ruled by Pluto. Nuclear scientists are ruled by Pluto. Violence is ruled by Pluto. Wars, x-rays, victims, venom, vampires hope you got all those things down. There are a few things and I hope that gives you some of the essence of this nuclear atomic planet that we are all living with in our charts these days. So let's move on now and see what Pluto represents for us when he transits certain houses in the horoscope. So how do we tell if we have Pluto transiting through our seventh house? Well, this one's really very easy actually. If your rising sign happens to sit exactly opposite where Pluto is, you've got the transit of Pluto occurring through your seventh house. Let's show through counting. So in this instance, we're looking at Leo. All Leo people for the next 20 years are going to have Pluto transiting through their seventh house. But let's count. One is Leo, the rising sign in whole sign astrology. Virgo is number two, Libra number three, Scorpio four, Sagittarius five, Capricorn six, and Aquarius is the seventh house from Leo. Now obviously if you're watching this after 20 years time, hopefully you are, then it will be in a different sign, Pluto will be in a different sign, and you will need to count from your ascendant to wherever Pluto currently happens to be transiting. Um, but in this instance for the next 20 years for Leo people, Pluto is in the seventh whole sign house. So what does that actually mean for Leo people? Well, and we're talking Leo rising people in this instance. It means that Leo people are going to be going through, or anyone who's having Pluto transit the seventh house, is going to be going through some serious changes with their relationship relationships are going to be transformed forever. Now this is business partnerships, this is marriages, this is contractual client relationships, big, big, big transformations, particularly at the beginning of this transit of Pluto and at the end of this transit of Pluto. So changes to relationships are inevitable for the duration of Pluto in Aquarius for Leo people or seventh house for anybody else watching in the future. Now, um, if you're in an existing relationship as you go into this transit, then problems, uh, it's, well, no, let me quantify that. If you're in, ex in an existing relationship and the relationship is rocky already, then these problems and their psychological causes are going to surface and become trouble points for the relationship. And they're either going to need to be addressed and resolved 
or the relationship is going to have to fold. So this often happens with Pluto transits. Pluto um, brings things to a head for better or for worse. So he is all about refining relationships in this instance and deepening relationships. So if you're in a good relationship where things are generally pretty healthy, you've got good communication, respect and patience for one another, love and care for one another, then the relationship is going to be refined to a higher level. It's going to deepen. It may become more passionate. It may become, uh, you know, uh, more, more of a powerful dynamic that you've got for the two of you to share. But like I said, if things are rocky as you head into this transit, then there's going to be some power struggles. There's going to be uh, some, some difficulties. So get prepared in your relationships, guys, Leo people and anyone in the subsequent years, um, because that's where the focus is going to go. Our love lives become very intense and very powerful components of our life when we have Pluto transiting the seventh. It's also that way when Pluto is in our natal chart in the seventh as well. Our love lives will always be intense and will always be a powerful component of who we are. So Pluto in the seventh just gives this effect generally, but we're talking about transits here. So um, if you are in a mundane or run-of-the-mill type of relationship, like a sort of a ho-hum, this will do, um, not really looking for anything out of the box and just trying to get by kind of a connection in a marriage or a business partnership or whatever, then that relationship's going to become unbearable under this transit because Pluto can't settle. Pluto won't tolerate uh, a lack of passion, a lack of intensity. Pluto won't, won't like that. And so he reveals to us where we are lacking the, the passion, the enthusiasm, the, uh, the depth of feeling and he causes us to change in those realms where it's not present. So half-assing it is not an option when Pluto transits through the house of relationships. If you are single and you're heading into Pluto transit the seventh house, well, this can bring you the most intense relationship experiences of your life, actually. Um, you know, Pluto doesn't want you to half-ass being single either. Now, some of us are perfectly content being single, and so Pluto has no work to do on people like that who really don't want to be in a relationship. But if you are someone who is single and you are like, I wish I had someone to share my life with, or to feel passionate love about, connection and so on, then Pluto is likely to bring those people across your path that you will have relationship with. Pluto is a highly karmic planet, so it could be even karmic connections that come your way where there is a need to resolve some sort of past life issue or um, relive some karma of some sort, good or bad, um, Pluto is likely to bring it your way during this transit. So uh, these, these relationships, if you're single, are going to be powerful, passionate and life-changing because Pluto is the planet of transformation. You won't go back to being the person that you were before this transit occurred when it comes to relationships and relationship dynamic. You'll never settle for a run-of-the-mill relationship again. Pluto is going to up-level you. Um, now, I want to say if you're single and going through this, be very conscious of the character of any new partners that you get tangled up with because the higher vibration of Pluto is quite wonderful. You know, passionate, soulmate kind of love as well can happen with Pluto here. Um, you know, intense love experiences that just, you know, make you tingle to your toes. That's That's fine. That's good. That's Pluto in the best sense of the word. But... Pluto also has a shadow side, which can exhibit during this time. And that can exhibit in partners who are controlling, manipulative, extremely obsessive, um, and even violent. Um, and, you know, partners who will make you stay their partner at all costs, you know. So as you, if you're single and you're entering into a love dynamic with somebody, make sure you kind of try and detach a bit and observe, okay, is this person, you know, got my best interests at heart? Are they ethical? Are they moral? Are they kind? You know, are they, am I going to have trouble with this person? Is it going to turn into a disaster? It's hard to perceive that sometimes, I, I know. But look at their character and look at the way they treat other people. Look at the way they treat maybe their children or their pets or their family um, and use that as a guide. So when we have relationship events, with Pluto moving through the seventh house as the trigger, it's usually going to bring about relationship events that happen very dramatically. Pluto is a dramatic little planet. So dramatic relationship occurrences. Think divorce, separations that sort of, 
not necessarily come out of the blue, but they're, you know, big dramas, big sort of intense experiences of the negative variety, but also of the positive, you know, big, intense, passionate love affairs, as well as big, passionate divorce settlements as well. Um, now, if Pluto happens to form a hard aspect, a square or an opposition, occasionally a conjunction, um, to the sun, this is your natal sun, your natal moon, the ruler of your ascendant, your ascendant lord. If he forms a hard aspect to Venus or the lord of the seventh house, so for Aquarius, sorry, for Leo rising people, that would be the lord of Aquarius is the lord of their seventh house, that's Saturn. If Pluto happens to form any hard aspects to your natal placements of those planets, then that's when we tend to see the divorces, the separations, the, you know, the, the super dramatic relationship endings occur under those particular transits. But the positive aspects, you know, if Pluto forms a trine or a sextile, sometimes a conjunction, um, to those, those particular planets, the Sun, the Moon, the Ascendant Lord, Venus and the Seventh House Lord, then it tends to bring in relationships that will uplift us empower us, take us to a higher level in life. You know, we don't go back to being the same old person we were. We are transformed um, and we, we can even meet powerful people under those transits. So even if it's not a relationship experience, we might meet someone very powerful who somehow transforms and blesses our life in a, in a miraculous way. Pluto with positive aspects to those planets. So this is the house of partners. And so if it's not affecting us, and it's affecting us by its opposition to the first house which represents us, if it's not affecting us, then it's likely to be affecting our partner. They might start to behave erratically or uncontrollably. They might start to behave passionately or intensely. They might start to behave jealously or manipulatively where they've never shown that before. Not every Leo will experience this in their partners, but it can happen. Some partners might seek excitement outside their marriage or you might seek excitement outside your marriage you know so forewarned forearmed there with that one it can happen and if it does it will be so all-consuming that it'll be like I can't breathe I can't breathe this is like um, just so all-consuming so uh, you know just overtakes my whole being I have to be with that person I have to know that person it's irresistible you, you look quite frankly you can't fight Pluto uh, if you try, you will lose, okay? So when he brings a person into our life, yes, it is karmic. And yes, it is there for a purpose to up-level us in some way, teach us lessons, or maybe um, take us through a dark night of the soul from which we learn. So be very, very careful about this. But you cannot resist the pull of Pluto and what he wants to do. So that just brings me to a point as a Libran moon person, uh, Librans like uh, to, well, we do judge a lot of things, but we also like balance and harmony and equality and fairness. And so I would just say, if you're observing someone going through this kind of a Pluto transit and you're tempted to judge them for having an affair with a married man or a married woman, if you're tempted to cast your opinion around, you know, um, then I just want to warn you, you know, um, People in glass houses shouldn't throw stones, you know. When Pluto comes around to transiting your seventh house, maybe you might be the one to go through that experience. I'm really, the thing I love about astrology is that it teaches us not to judge others, not to condemn others, because we often, especially in the case of Pluto, cannot help the energies that are flowing through our vessel, which is our body. Our body our vessel is the vessel of the um, celestial energies playing out through each life. And we sometimes have absolutely no conscious control over what is happening to us. We just have to flow and go with what the energies are doing. So please, no judgment of anybody who's going through that sort of circumstance. It is sometimes just traumatic and guilt ridding, <laughs> fills us with guilt, fills us with um, trauma, um, fills us with self-loathing and shame because we don't want to be participating, let, let's say, in an affair. Um, and yet Pluto is doing what he feels he must do for whatever soul contract we came in to fulfill this lifetime. So um, yes, it is painful when people go 
uh, you know, people have partners who go through affairs. Absolutely. But it's about walk a mile in my shoes, you know. A lot of the time partners are suffering as well when that sort of thing happens. So I'm not here to, to preach, but I just I really want people to not be judgy about what relationship things occur. Um, act with love, act with kindness, act with grace. If you are in that position or if you are observing someone in that position, please. Okay, back to what occurs when Pluto transits through the seventh house. Um, so either your partner or you, if you have this configuration, uh, may actually feel like you finally found your soulmate. So again, you know, you've been living a mundane sort of this will do kind of a relationship and in comes this person that Pluto's brought along into your life and you're like, oh my God, this person, I feel like I've known them in another lifetime. I feel like they're part of me. They just get me. This is, <gasps> this is a soulmate connection. It's hard. And that's what Pluto can do. He can bring in soulmate connections. If you're married, if you're single, it doesn't matter. So what this is teaching us is that we're learning how to truly give and receive in an empowered way from other people with Pluto transiting here. So fairness, equality, compromise, these are all the big life lessons of this transit, which is why I say don't judge. You're actually going to be learning the other sort of more extended values of the seventh house, which is harmony, balance, equality, compromise. So uh, to to condemn does has no place here because there, but for the grace of God, go you or I. So big life lessons for everybody involved in this particular transit at this time. Now, not everybody is going to have a bust up. Not everybody is going to, you know, go down that road of, you know, affairs and so on. But um, Pluto wants to increase our personal power and sometimes we need to stand in our own power when those things occur. So there will be some people who go through that. Other people will learn to take back their personal power from others because this is the, the realm of the chart that has to do with others. This is us, this is others. And some of us are here to learn to take back our power from others where we've given it away, where it doesn't deserve to be given. Um, so Pluto, what he will do is bring life events and circumstances into our world that trigger us to take back our power and we're going to start to feel like we have more power and control over our own destiny when Pluto transits the seventh house. So that might look like in a business circumstance somebody's been swindling you or you know t stealing money from the till or something in a business partnership and you have to learn to stand up and say hey no you know you need to pay all that back or I'm going to go to the courts with you, you know. Um, that's an example of needing to stand up and take back your personal power with a relationship that's not of a marriage variety. So it's going to happen in, it can happen in many and varied ways. So I've talked a lot about relationships because that's what we mostly see from the seventh house is the personal relationships, but it can happen in other ways too that's designed to help you take back personal power where you may have actually lost it in your life. Um, we actually, when Pluto moves through the seventh house by opposition to the house of us, we, we um, stop holding ourselves back now. We stop holding our power back and we stop censoring ourselves. We start to stand in our truth and own our power, which is quite an exciting component of this transit, actually. Um, we can actually, because this is also a business house, it's the 10th house from the 10th in the Bavat Bavam system, we can gain more success in business and social activities um, through this transit as well. So much more success and empowerment coming to those areas of our life. Some people might also discover a mentor or a guru. This is the house of other people and Pluto can you know, bring in those sorts of high power dynamic people into our lives that are inspirational and life-changing and will transform us. So gurus, mentors and so on. So just be careful of the manipulative, domineering variety of guru, um, which do exist, let's face it. Not everybody's in there for the right reasons. Um, so that can be the case. But again, you need to have your awareness about you as you observe um, the people that you're encountering for the next 20 years in your life. Uh, and finally, legal cases. Leg this is a house of you know lawyers and um, going to court and that sort of thing. So legal cases can arise during this time. Again, as with Pluto's agenda, they're designed to teach you to take back your power or to empower you where you've lost your power. Uh, so you know whatever circumstance arises, whether you win at court or you lose at court or it's you know gets thrown out or whatever, it, the purpose is 
to help you take back your power in some manner and it may do it through the use of the court system. So the keys to working with this hairy little transit basically we need to remain conscious um, you know if we are you know entering into a new relationship or trying to work with our existing relationship um, you know the more conscious we are conscious we are <laughs> then the more we're not going to get involved with somebody who is going to you know destroy us manipulate us be violent towards us so be cautious and careful I'm not saying put up the big wall so that no love ever comes into your life but um, I'm saying, you know, if the first sign of something up, you know, mm, I think, you know, you go find your own house to live in and I'll live in my house and I'm happy to go on dates, but let's not just get too embedded in this, you know. Caution with your uh, awakened consciousness. Um, so weigh up the character traits of any partners that you encounter business-wise, you know, um, contracts with um, clients and and marriages and so forth. Um, be objective, you know, lest you get involved with a destructive personality. Address any relationship problems during this transit, or particularly if you can address them before this transit really kicks in, then you know you have the chance to air the dirty laundry, and it doesn't need to come up under the the you know rather traumatic transit of Pluto through the seventh house. So the more you can deal with beforehand, the more psychological work you can do beforehand, the more relational therapy you can do beforehand, the better you're going to navigate this as a couple. Um, so great. And also if you're single and dealing with issues around singleness, do the same thing because the more you can deal with that sort of thing, the more ready you are for whatever Pluto is going to do for you as a single person when he transits through the seventh house. Um, so raise issues with your partner and see a counsellor if it's necessary and required. Honesty, honesty with yourself and honesty with your partners is very helpful now because uh, Pluto is not the planet of the truth, but he does like to expose what is hidden. So if you're not being honest, if you're not being true with your partner, Pluto will just pull the rug out from under you and expose it anyway. So you might as well come clean, you know? You might as well get it out there. Whatever you're having troubles with, whatever you've got hiccups with, whatever they're doing that pisses you off, bring, raise it. Bring it up in a, in a loving, caring environment so that Pluto doesn't have to do the work and you're going to be in a much better position. And finally, do introspective work regarding wherever it is you may have given your power away to other people um, and then take action to restore what was lost. So that could be, you know, in a business relationship, you've allowed someone to stomp all over you and treat you like a doormat and whatever, or a marriage. It could even be, like this is the house of all other people in our life. It could be a parent that you're giving your power away to. It could be, uh, I don't know, a sibling. It could be somebody else. Most likely it's a contractual relationship, but look, it could be someone else. And it certainly behoves you uh, to look at, well, where in my life, in any relationship, have I given my power away? Do that work. Do that introspective work and then see what you need to do to restore your power back to you. I am speaking from, you know, something that I should do for myself. I probably, you know, I'm, I'm a Leo sun person, not a Leo rising person, but I absolutely should explore that topic myself so that I can stand in my own power. We all should do that from time to time. But this is your time, my beautiful Leo rising friends and anyone who's having Pluto in the seventh house um, after the coming 20 year transit through Aquarius. So thanks for joining me for this one. It's been fun and very interesting to explore this rather important and potent house in the chart, which is angular, so therefore it's felt much more succinctly by anyone experiencing a 7th house Pluto transit. And uh, I look forward to sharing with you next week Pluto's transit through the 8th house, so do join me for that one then.